and a pleasure to have Brother Roger Buttrell with us. He, as I said, he's been pastoring, been in the ministry for many years. We first crossed paths way back in Wisconsin many, many moons ago. And uh, one of the things I appreciate about many of the friends, in fact, all the friends that God has given to me, I am just thankful for uh, not only that they're saved and that they're trying to serve God, but they have stayed faithful over the years. Brother Betrell has been a faithful man to God and to his family and to his church and to his ministries. And uh, so it's a real, real privilege and a pleasure to have him here. Brother Betrell, you come if you would. Give to us what God's given to you. Preach it, brother. Amen. Brother. Fly. Praise the Lord. All right. Just before I get started, I wondered what I was going to put a ditto on that. It's unusual for a church 45 years old to still be an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, separated Baptist church and uh, still has good standards, still has good uh, preaching and still has good people and so on. And praise the Lord. I thank God for your church here. I just want to mention that almost everything on my book table back there is written by my son-in-law, Scott Hanks, who is pastor at Heritage Baptist Church in Lawrence, Kansas. It's a KJV church also, just like this one. And um, uh, he has a great ministry there. He writes a lot of material. And that's only, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that he's written that I don't even have with me. So uh, he's written a lot of stuff. But um, just a couple of things back there. There's a discipleship uh, packet back there. In fact, I only have one of them left on this particular file. So if somebody wants it, you'll need to get back there and get it. But it has five booklets in it. It's only $10 for the five booklets. And there's two, that's $2 a piece. And uh, that's not bad. And, but uh, it helps new Christians to grow in the Lord. And then you can get one of those and teach it to a new convert having this new soul winning program that, and you win somebody to Christ, then you need to take responsibility of helping them to grow in the Lord. Uh, I just led uh, one of my neighbors in Indiana there to Christ just about three weeks ago and uh, told, her, told her after I led her to the Lord, I said, now listen, we need to get together every week so we can learn some things from the Bible of what God expects of you. And uh, she's been avoiding that. Uh, and, uh, she's been working a lot of hours and so on, but I uh, hope to get her discipled when I get back there, but I'm going to be gone two months here in New York and we'll get back to later. But there's a pack of, of uh, books back there called the Walk in Truth series. There's 20 books in that, in that packet and uh, you can get them individually for $3 a piece, but that's $60. You can get the whole packet for $40. And that's uh, really very reasonable. I'd like to mention that all of them, all the books have 31 pages. So you can use them. They're tremendous for uh, family devotions. To use them uh, in your family devotions or even individual devotions. But this one happens to be just one I grabbed in a second ago uh, off of the pile. But this is about sports. It says... Uh, accepting a bad call, defense, doing your best, don't be distracted, don't hog the ball, don't quit, exercise, good sportsmanship, halftime, handling praise, uh, lay aside every weight, listening to the coach, and just 31 different topics about sports to help your kids have the right picture of what sports are, is all about. Um, you don't want anybody, uh, and your preacher doesn't, and neither do I, want anybody to take your kids out of church on Wednesday night and take them to little league practice. That's stupid. I mean, you're telling your kids that, uh, well, God's important, but Little League's more important than God is, you know, and that's why we take them out on Wednesday night and take them to Little League. You're an idiot if you do that. And you say, well, I'm not inviting you back. Well, uh, that's, uh, I'll give you the whole load today then. And, but uh, anyway, uh, but that one's on sports, and there's, a, there's, a, each, there's on the home and and uh, all kinds of different subjects on these, those 20 books. And they'll help you in your Christian life to grow in the Lord. Uh, and there's a bunch of other things back there that can be a help to you too. It is so good to be here at Freedom Baptist Church. And uh, Brother Dunbar and I, uh, we have some good memories from things in the past. And, and I thank the Lord for him. And I thank, you mo thank the Lord most of all for him sticking by the stuff and being the same today as he was 40 years ago when we met. I mean, goodness, uh, there's not very many people like that. And I praise the Lord uh, for that. Your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank God for that. And congratulations on 45 years uh, here at uh, your church. And God bless you. I guess uh, Maranatha in Lyons is celebrating 50 years in September. 
And so uh, they're excited about that too. Um, let me just say that uh, I pray for your church often, asking God to bless Brother Dunbar and bless your church and, and just open up the windows of heaven and shower out blessings. And, and um, I believe that you have a great preacher. Sometimes when you have a preacher for a long time, you get used to him and you don't appreciate him as much as you ought to. Uh, listen, folks, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of churches in America that don't have a pastor right now that would love to have somebody like your husband. I like your, not your husband, uh, your, uh, your preacher. Where's sister, uh, what you call it? Oh, good, glad she didn't hear that. <laughs> um, I believe you have a great preacher and you ought to keep him. Um, and then, uh, uh, congratulations, Sarah Finster's probably not in here either, but congratulations, oh, there she is over there. Congratulations to her getting married. I'm, uh, she worked, of course, with us over in our Christian school in, uh, in Lyons there when I was pastor, and, and uh, we love her, and we just thank God for her and her faithfulness to God. And uh, let me just say, you honor God with your life, and God will give you the desires of your heart. And she's been faithful to the Lord for many years. I'm not going to ask her how old she is, but she's past 18. <laughs> and um, she's been faithful to the Lord, and God has given her a husband. I hope he is wonderful and will be the desire of your heart as you get him there. And so, but anyway, uh, uh, turn to John chapter 3 in your Bibles, please. John chapter number 3. And that's... Um, uh, a passage of scripture that you all are familiar with. It probably not going to be a message that you've heard before, but uh, John chapter three, verse number twelve. I want to start with verse number twelve of John chapter three. I've preached about every verse or two in in John chapter three over the years, but John chapter three, verse number twelve, and we want to read through verse sixteen. Would you all have been standing quite a bit this morning? But would you want to stand for the reading of the word of God? In John chapter 3, verse 12 through number 16, just a short time there. If I told you of earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's all say the next verse together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give me liberty as I preach this morning. We thank you, Jesus, for dying on Calvary's cross. We thank you, Lord, for seeing us as valuable. Lord, we look at ourselves, and if we're honest, we don't see ourselves as valuable. We see ourselves as wicked sinners that, by the grace of God, have been born again. And Lord, we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lead and direct as I speak this morning. And I'll praise you for that. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. If there's somebody here and they're not born again, then I pray that today will be the day that you repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your personal Savior. I pray that that'll be the case in your own personal life and it'll be the most exciting thing that you've ever done, you've ever done in your life. Do you know that God values you? If I said... Um, how important are you to God? Well, you, you're so important that God, sent God's, uh, that God sent heaven's greatest treasure to buy you, to pay for you, to pay for your sin. You know, one way of determining how much something is worth is finding out what somebody else would pay for that. You know, a lot of our possessions, we think more of them than they're actually worth. And if you try to sell them, you may get a little bit of money, but you probably won't get as much as you think your items are worth for probably just about anyth anything that you have. 
Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a big item like your car or your house or whether it's a little item like a, a dress or a pair of slacks or something. But God puts a worth on us. God values you. In Mark chapter 8, verse 36, it puts it in a little bit of perspective where he says, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you were a rich man and you had all the money that you needed in the whole world and you could buy anything that you want, what in the world would the profit be? Because when you die, you're not taking nothing with you. Bill Gates, Elon Musk, all those guys, they're going to die the same as you and I are going to die one of these days and they're not taking nothing with them. And they're all going to stand before a just God and find out where they're going to go. When you die, all of your personal possessions will be worth nothing. Somebody else is going to get them. Your soul is worth more, though, than all the possessions added together in the whole world. If you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, you've lost what are you worth? You're, you're worth what a person is willing to pay for it, for you. Do you know a father told his daughter that he had a gift for her and that he bought it a long time ago and he's going to give it to her now. And she thought, uh-oh, it's old. I wonder what it is. And he gave it to her and it was a vehicle. And he said, I want you to take this vehicle down to the used car lot and ask them what they'll give you for it. So she took that old junk car down to the car lot and the guy said he'd give her $1,500. She went home, told her dad that he said he would give me $1,500 for that old junk heap out there. Wow. And he says, no, I don't want you to quit there. I want you to go down to the pawn shop. And I want you to ask them what they'll give you for the car. So she took the car down to the pawn shop and asked them. And that guy said, listen, this car is pretty rusty and this car is pretty old. We'll give you $500 for it. So she came home and said, Dad, it's getting worse. It's only $500 is what they said that it was worth. He said, well, we're not done yet. I want you to uh, take this car and take it down to the old car club that they have and they gather all these, new, these old jalopies together every once in a while. Take it down there and show them and ask two or three of those guys what they think that they would give you for it. And she came home and her eyes were bugging out and she says, Dad, there were several people down at that place that said they would give me a hundred thousand dollars for that old jump, jump, pile of heat, junk out there. And so, what is that car worth? Well, to one guy, it was worth fifteen hundred. To one, it was worth five hundred. To some others, it was worth a hundred thousand dollars. Your worth depends on who you're selling it to. Your the value of something is determined by uh, how much the individual that's going to buy it is willing to pay. And her dad told her, he says, you know, the right place will value you a lot. But the wrong place will not put much value on you. So you need to make sure that you get to the right place to where somebody that will appreciate you and thank God for you. Now here in this church, You'll find what God has paid for you. And you'll fall in love with this place. You'll fall in love with your preacher 
preaching the word of God. You'll fall in love with the standards that it has here. You'll fall in love with the doctrines from the word of God that's here. Uh, and folks, we will fall in love here if we will get our head screwed on straight. You know, you say, you'll get to the place to where you'll say, I want to be faithful to God. I want to do all I can to honor the Lord Jesus Christ here at Freedom Baptist Church. And you know, the question is, was, were some of these people trying to scam this little girl? <clears throat> The guy that offered $1,500? No, there are a lot of people that will try to scam you in the world. And <clears throat> could be that the used car dealer knew it was worth a lot of money. <coughs> but uh, in this world, people will try to hurt you. Others will try to mess with the value of your life. You're worth a lot to God. You are worth a lot to the Lord. Others who just don't know the value of you, you don't know the value of yourself, and they maybe just honestly uh, don't know what you're worth. But you know, some people, they believe that they're a product of evolution. They believe that they, their ancestor called up out of a swamp somewhere and evolved and evolved and pretty soon became a monkey and then you evolved from that and you used to be a monkey and but I believe the Bible that one day God took of the dust of the earth and he formed Adam in his own image and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then a little bit later, he put Adam to sleep and took one of his ribs and made a woman. Do you know that Adam married the most beautiful woman in the whole world? And you and I, Trace it all the way back. We're all related to Adam. Do you know, in the Bible, you'll find out your true value. You'll find out the value that God places upon you. You'll understand your value and you'll get really involved in Freedom Baptist Church and you'll really grow in the Lord, become a giant Christian, and you'll make this church a part of your life and you'll make the Bible a part of your life. You'll read the word of God and you'll hide God's word in your heart that you might not sin against the Lord and you'll grow in the Lord. Uh, you know, no one in the world has ever valued you as much as God the Father values you. Who was it that loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son? God's the only one that did that. We just quoted John 3, 16 a little bit ago and you saw that that was true. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I'd tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. You know, if you want to value others while you're on this earth, which is the part of... That's part of what you and I are supposed to be doing. Um, the great commandment is, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. I have met very few people in my life that have obeyed either one of those commandments. But it takes some real character to love your neighbor as yourself. How much do we love other people? I went to Africa on a missions trip many years ago and landed at Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, the capital of the Ivory Coast. And missionary picked me up. And I was riding in the back of an extended cab pickup. And the missionary and his wife were in the front. And as we were going down the road, there were people walking down the highway both directions because a lot of people didn't have cars in Africa or don't have cars in Africa. And 
Uh, all the ladies were carrying things on their head. They had these, and some of them were carrying a hundred pounds of stuff or more, even more on the top of their head as they were walking from town to town. And the men, they didn't carry nothing. I thought that was a pretty good idea. We ought to bring that over here to America, you know. But just joking, ladies, just joking. Um, but um, uh, the, the ladies were carrying all these things and I was riding along watching all these people and I said to our missionary, do you know, brother missionary, every one of these people are a soul for whom Jesus died. And he said, that's right, preacher. And we drove down the road about another, we were going about 350 miles from the airport you know, and a few more miles and God spoke to my heart and she said, he said to me, he said, you little hypocrite. You've been in America all these years and you've drove, driven by millions of people and you've never said one time in America all of these people are a soul for whom Jesus died. And I got under conviction and I thought I better start caring for people in America the way I ought to. Why do I have to go to a foreign field in order to care for a lost soul somewhere? Do you know we can't value another soul and other people like we should until we find out how much God values you. Not long ago, there was a saying going around, and you all have heard it, black lives matter. You've heard that. Yes, black lives matter. But perhaps there's some out there who are not being valued like they should be valued. But somebody else cried, blue lives matter. That's the police officers. And yes, the police officers matter too. I even have a little sign on the back of my trailer that I pull on the back of my RV that says police lives matter. Hopefully that a police will notice that if they ever stop me, uh, you know, with the, with the thing. And uh, then they say, oh yeah, won't give him a ticket, you know. But, uh, you know, but... I'm sure thankful for police, though, and glad that you can call them whenever you're in trouble and you need some help and so on. And so I love them and respect them and, and uh, so on, except when they're behind me and they're getting ready to turn that red light on, then I don't love them quite as much right then at that particular moment. Do you know, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I had a 1965 GTO convertible, red with a white top, chrome wheels, chrome valve cover, covers, and chrome air cleaner, and, and a four-speed Hearst transmission on the floor. And uh, every time I went by a policeman, he'd turn around and follow me. And man, I got more tickets than when I was 17 and 18 years old than in my whole life, all put together. Man, I even got a ticket one time on the way home from paying a ticket. So uh, uh, at that... <laughs> That particular time of my life, I didn't appreciate police as much as I should. But you know, others say all lives matter. Let me just say, you matter to God. We need to understand that God loves everyone. God values people. I may not know much about you, but I want you to know that you are valuable to God Almighty. God loves you. So you matter to God and you matter to me. Years ago, there was a show on TV. It might even be still on there. I don't watch TV hardly ever anymore. Hardly ever see anything on TV. But there was a show called uh, The Antique Road Show. Some of you may have seen that, maybe watched it and so on. It started in England many years before it came to America, but it's been in America for a while and it, it may still be on the air, I don't know. But uh, people would bring their old items to the antique road show and they would uh, get them appraised and they would tell them how much a particular item was worth and, and it was an interesting show. Uh, but there was a girl named Clara Beckman I don't know who she was, but it just came across her name. And, and she went to a yard sale. Uh, ladies love yard sales. And they had a whole bunch of them in Lyons area yesterday. Probably had a bunch of them over here. But uh, uh, she found a little table. It was just a little bitty table. And the guy had a price of $30 on it. 
Well, she talked to the guy there and she talked him down to $25. So she bought that little table for $25. And it just so happened that within the next few weeks, the antique roadshow came to her area of the country. And she thought, I'm going to take that little table down there just to, for the fun of it to see what they'll tell me. And so she did. And uh, the guy appraised that thing. And do you know that he appraised that little $25 table for $250,000? She was bug-eyed, man. She couldn't believe that. And she took it to Sotheby's in, in New York City and had it auctioned off. And she was not, he was not right on that estimate. That particular little table brought, brought $541,212, I believe is what it was, that that, that table brought. And, and so, uh, whoops, I'm going the wrong, pay, wrong direction there on my notes. Uh, but uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, they had the Antique Road Show went there one time, and uh, this guy named Patrick Philippe, or Felipe, or however you say his name, he had a pocket watch. And he took that pocket watch to the Antique Road Show, and the guy looked at it, and it was a, a, a real nice watch and so on, and he had it appraised before somewhere, and the guy said it was worth $6,000. And so, uh, uh, so at the Antique Roadshow, he also appraised that watch with a value of $250,000, one pocket watch. So he took it also to Southby's and had them auction it off, and the auctioneer was a little off on what he valued that because he got $1,541,000 dollars for that watch, that pocket watch. Wow. Now you're going to start looking for pocket watches at yard sales, <laughs> right? Um, but here we are today at Freedom Baptist Church. The heavenly appraisers here today, and you say, what am I worth? God takes a look at you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your sin. He knows any secret sins in your life. He knows all of your faults. He knows everything about you. He knows when you lose your temper. He knows when you're thinking bad thoughts. What are you worth to God? You are worth the exchange of God's greatest treasure, Jesus Christ the Son of God who came to die in your place so that you could receive Christ as your Savior. What is the reality of your worth? Well, pretend that birds could talk. And you went outside early in the morning and heard the birds chirping and singing. And they say, listen to me a minute, the birds do. And they say, my life is not perfect, but I can sing. And God looks after me, and there is a God that looks after you. But you know that he values you more than he values me. Shouldn't you be the one that's singing? Matthew 10, 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So a sparrow, <laughs> worth a half a farthing. Not much. But he can sing. Little sparrow, how much God values you. For when we were yet without strength... In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was a wonderful person that 
if it was a wonderful person that Christ died for, we would say, oh, I understand. They were a wonderful person. But it wasn't a wonderful person that Christ died for. It was you. And you're not a wonderful person. You're a sinner. You deserve to go to hell. I deserve, compared to God, we're vile. Compared to God, we're no good. There was a, a story about a railroad track. It came down, and then the railroad track, track split. And there was a switch there that made the train go one way or the other. Imagine you're standing there, and you are put in charge of the switch. The train is coming, and your little girl, your little baby girl is tied to one direction. And the most vile, ungodly man on the earth was tied to the other section. And the train's coming. Which way are you going to switch it? Well, obviously, you're not going to let your daughter die. You're going to let the train run over the crook. Let's change the scenario just a minute. Let's put God the Father at the switch. And put Jesus Christ on one side, tied to the track. And put you on the other side, tied to the track. Here comes the train. God the Father. Who are you going to let die? You or Jesus Christ? God said, I'm going to give my son so that this one can repent. Maybe they'll never repent. Maybe they'll never pay any attention to me. Maybe they won't, but maybe they will. And he lets his son get killed so that you would have a chance of trusting the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Think about it. Oh, how we need to put things in the right perspective. Do you know, God took his son, let him die in your place. That's the reality of your worth. What's your reaction whenever you hear about that and, and you know about what your worth is? The reaction from one who knows that, uh, who's known God for a long time and many of you have been saved for years and years and years. You sat and listened to the great music this morning that we sang. All kinds of wonderful songs that we sang. And you were reminded of how good God is. And then you heard people lift their voice up and pray. And we had the opportunity to put an offering in the offering plate and give to God a portion of what he's given to us. And, 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 and you say in your mind, I'm not going to waste my life running after the things of this world that money could buy. I'm going to put God First of my life, and I'm going to run after the things of God and let Him control my life and let Him lead me in my life. Let Him help me. The Bible gives us a verse about that. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We should run after the things of God as a reaction to how much he valued you and saved your soul. And you could have, he could have just said, they're not worth saving and let you die and go to hell. But he died for you and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm not willing that any should perish, he said, but that all should come to repentance. God put you first when he let his son die in your place. So I want to spend the rest of my life putting him first. With my talent and my treasure and my time. Oh, how we all ought to do that in our own life. You might be saying, well, I don't value people the way that I should. You know, when we get away from God, we don't value people like we should. We need to get close to God. That's why this soul winning thing is so important of going and, and doing these surveys and things like this. Everybody ought to get involved. You might be the one to say, if I'm so valuable, 
When are people going to start recognizing how valuable I am and start treating me better? That's one way to look at it. But the songwriter said, All my life was filled with sin when Jesus found me. Oh, my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led them in the way I ought to go. <coughs> no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he, no one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. A good parent who has, has children and he wants them to develop into something that's valuable. A parent tells his child, yes, or know about things all of their life. Why? Because he wants them to grow up and be valuable. And that's what, why there's things in the Bible that God tells you to do. And things in the Bible that God tells you not to do. Why? Because he wants you to increase in value to the world and, and so on. And uh, you say, my parents don't value me because they just hold me back and keep me from what I want. Children are valued, though, by their precious parents. They recognize that that value, and they're trying to help mold you into what God wants you to be, and, and so on. And God wants to mold you into what He wants you to be also. That's why there's directions in the Word of God, and that God says to do this and not do that, and to be what we ought to be, and so on. We think in the Word of God of... of uh, Samson, he wanted his own way. He said, get me that girl. And mom and dad said, Samson, that's a Philistine woman. You don't need her. She, there's plenty of good Israelite ladies. No, 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 you don't. And he said, give me that girl. He wanted his way. And you know the story that he ended up losing his eyesight and died in shame. And one of these days we'll see Samson in heaven and so on. But God is worth you giving him everything you are. God's worth that. Giving him whatever he asks. There's no one that loves you like God loves you. Not anyone. Let God's love motivate you for the rest of your life and say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Lord, I want to be what you want me to be. Lord, help me not to hold back. I know you love me so much, Lord. You gave your son to die for me that I could have eternal life. Romans 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, what's the responsibility of your worth? Since God values us so highly, you ought to want to honor him. You ought to want to put him number one in your life. Does God come first for you? A dad came to his little girl when she was only four or five years old and he gave her a little set of fake pearls. She loved those fake pearls. Number one, she didn't know they were fake. She loved those little fake pearls and, and a few years passed and then dad came and said, hey, sweetheart, would you give me those pearls? Oh, no, daddy, they're my pearls. I really love these pearls. I'm not going to give them to you. And dad says, okay, and he walks away. Sometime later, he came back and said, hey, doll, sweetheart, would you give me those pearls? Oh, no, daddy, I won't. I won't give you those pearls. They're my pearls and they're so precious to me. And as she grew, one day she got convicted about being so stingy with her dad. And 
thought, I'll give up these pearls for, for daddy. And he came and said, sweetheart, would you give me those pearls? And she says, yes, daddy. Here's the pearls. And she gave them to her daddy. Well, her daddy reached into his pocket and pulled out a little box. And it had some genuine, real pearls in it. And she gave up her fake pearls. And dad replaced them with some real pearls when she was willing to give up the old fake pearls to her dad. You know, when God wants something from you, give it to him. Just give it to him. When God wants something, he has better things in store for you. I don't have time, but if I were to take the time, I could tell you dozens of stories of how through my life, God said, when I've maybe at somebody's house, he said, you know that $100 bill you got stuck in that secret part of your billfold? Give it to him. I said, Lord, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'd reach in my billfold and pull out the $100 bill and gave it to him. And I've had people break down weeping in thankfulness when I do that sometimes. Invariably, before a few days have gone by, God's replaced the $100 with something else that is worth far more. I've seen him do it over and over and over and over and over. I couldn't even tell you the stories without weeping of how good God has been. Do you know, how much is Jesus worth to you? Well, he's worth whatever somebody else is willing to pay. Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver. What would you pay for Jesus? What's he worth to you? You know, how much is Jesus worth to you? Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never Know just why he came to save me Till someday I see his blessed face above No one ever cared for me Like Jesus No one else could take the sin and darkness from me Oh, how much he cared for me. Could we have every head bowed for a minute, every eye closed? I'd like to ask a couple of questions. You say, preacher, I'm saved. I, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm born again. But God's spoken to me this morning. And I'd like to have prayer concerning my Christian life. Realizing how valuable Jesus is, I'd like God to help me to be more sensitive and submissive to his will for my life and doing what he wants. If you'd slip your hand up, I'll remember you in prayer. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. There's hands all over in the back and in the middle, way in the back. And God bless you in all three sections. God bless you. You can put your hands down now. Now let me ask you this. You say, preacher... If I died right now, I, I don't know that I'd for sure go to heaven. I, I doubt it. I don't know. But if you're doubting it and you don't know for sure, would you slip up your hand and let me remember you in prayer, preacher? I'd sure like to know. Just slip your hand up and hold it there a minute. Let's all stand for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I come to you today, Lord, and we're thankful that you answer prayer. We're thankful, Lord, that I'd suppose about 20 people, I would think, raised their hands this morning. God, I couldn't point all of them out exactly, but you saw every one of them. Lord, I pray that you would 
help these that raise their hands. Lord, if you're speaking to their hearts, help them to get their prayer answered in their heart. If they want to be more submissive to you. They want to do what you want them to do in their life. They, they want to express their love for you, Lord, and they want to show you that they really do love you. And I pray that you would help them, Lord, as you lead them and direct them in their lives. And Lord, answer their request and their prayer. And Lord, many of these, they need to come to this altar this morning and pray and talk to you and get these things settled in their heart and their life between you and them. I pray that you'd answer these requests for Christ's sake. If anybody's not saved, may they come to the front and take my hand or the preacher's hand and Lord, we'll find somebody to show them exactly how they can get to heaven. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and as the pianist or organist plays, God speak into your heart. Slip out of your seat. Just say, excuse me, somebody's in the way and come to this altar and pray. And Did you really mean it a minute ago? You raised your hand, you wanted prayer. You want God to do something in your life. Don't, don't say no to the Holy Spirit of God when He's speaking to you. You just come up and Kneel down at one of these altars. If you can't kneel, you can sit on the front pew or whatever you want to do. You just slip out. Some of them are coming. What about you? Did you really, really want God to do something in your life? You really want to be surrendered to Him? Will you come? Will you spend some time talking to God to seal this decision in your heart and let God lead you and direct you in your heart and your life?